Hi, I'm Dr. Chiwi Tan, and I'm the module coordinator for the research dissertation module. Before you embark on your journey of um, conducting your project and writing up the dissertation, I'd like to introduce you to some of the basic things that you need to know before you embark on this journey. There are some learning outcomes that we will be actually doing, uh, that we'll be trying to achieve for this particular module. And this is written in your module handbook, as well as on this particular slide, which you can download from the hub itself. So if you, are, if you want to follow the slides, but can't really see it on the screen, what you can do is download it and either print it out or put it on the screen and follow the slides according to what's um, in the notes itself. But there are some important things that I want you to note regards to the uh, learning outcomes. Is that this particular uh, module will require a lot of um, personal effort as well as um, time commitment to this entire project. But we will actually help guide you, your supervisors, both your um, academic as well as your clinical advisors will guide you along this journey. So one thing to reassure you is that you will not be on your own when you are embarking on your dissertation journey. There are several key events that you need to take note of during this um, dissertation journey. And I've actually outlined this uh, on the slide. So you may or may not have already received your outline project form. The reason why you receive that form is because you already passed about 120 credits um, throughout for, for the entire um, master's program. And therefore, this is the last module where you gain 60 credits in order to top it up to gain a master's degree. Now, when you pass the 120 credits, what we will do is to send you the project outline form. And what you need to do is fill that in and send it back to me or the module coordinator. After we receive your form, what we will do is to allocate you an appropriate academic supervisor of which you can then start to contact them in order to discuss your project proposal or what you intend to do. During this period of time, what will happen is that the discussion between your supervisors and yourself will um, sort of refine and tune to, um, in terms of the details of the project so that what you can do is that you'll be um, trying to do a much more feasible a much more relevant project to where your work uh, is located. After you develop the um, idea, what you're required to do is to fill up um, approval forms. The main approval form that you need to fill up is for a, a data collection sort of um, project will be the, um, you need to write a proposal which is about um, 2,000 words as well as filling in any appropriate research ethics documentation in order to seek approval. There are several places that you might have to seek research ethics approval from. One is the NHS research ethics, or if that is not relevant, then you'll need also to seek um, Queen Margaret University research ethics as well. For some projects, for example, where you might be conducting audits or service evaluations, you may have to seek additional um, approvals, for example, counter court approvals, quality improvement team approvals, and your NHS board R&D approvals. After you've filled in all the paperwork and you've, uh, you've actually submitted them, usually this takes, about, uh, takes some time for that to come through. And once you've got all the approvals ready, then we we'll, can then proceed on to the next stage. For those who are actually doing systematic reviews, your approvals are slightly simpler in that you're only required to write what's called a protocol. The protocol will outline everything that you plan to do in terms of your systematic review and your literature search. And this will be also in discussion with your supervisors in order to see the appropriateness of your research question and the type of systematic review that is appropriate to the question that you want to achieve. Then what you need to do is fill up um, a, a protocol, uh, write out a protocol and fill up some forms and then send it on to the module co coordinator and then we will then look at it, review it and then give you the approval. When all these approvals have been uh, obtained, well, we can then move on to the next stage. Now that's when your 28 week clock starts. 
when we receive notice that you have you get all your approvals, we will set a date that is the beginning of your 28 weeks, and that's the time where you're supposed to um, com uh, complete your project within that period, including the writing up of your dissertation and, and the submission. We will help keep track and uh, help to remind you of when the deadlines are. And in that, um, when we first notify you of the 28 weeks, we will also give you the final date where you are required to submit your final dissertation or rather the intermediate um, products that comes out from this particular module. Because the products that we gain, uh, we, we require from you in this dissertation module is actually slightly different to what a traditional dissertation module would require. Talking about the first, uh, talking about intermediate products within this module, the very first piece of work that you need to hand in that will be graded will be your 3,000 word background or review and that is required at the 12 week clock so from the start of where we give you the deadline to the 12 week that is the time where you need to submit your first piece of work which is a 3,000 word assignment the second piece of work which is the final piece of work will be the 5,000 word scientific paper which will be submitted at the end of the 28 weeks If we break down the entire dissertation into stages, we can say that it actually consists of three main stages. The first stage is where we select, when, when you select your project, think about your project or what you want to do, and after which we'll match you up with the appropriate supervisors to guide you in this dissertation journey. The second stage is where you further develop your idea into a slightly more advanced level, after which you will then write up your proposal or your protocol and then submit, the, um, uh, uh, submit all the paperwork in order to gain all the relevant approvals that you need to conduct this project. The third stage is the actual undertaking of the project itself. For example, if you're doing a data collection, therefore it's the time when you actually start collecting data from the participants. Or if you're doing a systematic review, it's a time where you actually do all the literature searches, the systematic uh, approaches to doing your literature searches and gaining all the, all the papers in order for you to finally write your 5,000 word systematic review. Once you've done all your analysis um, and, you, and, and, and you, you, you've got the data ready, it's time for you to write up the dissertation, which is your 5,000 word paper. Now let's talk a little bit about stage one, where, where you select the proposal, uh, where you actually select the project. Now, at this stage, as I said before, you may or may not have received your project outline form. And if you haven't received it yet, I'll ask you to um, email me so that I can actually send the outline project form to you. Now, what I want you to do is not to put too much effort into um, write, uh, writing the project outline form. The project outline form is just to sort of sketch out your idea and it's basically a draft. It's to give me and your program leaders an idea of what sort of ideas or what areas of the project do you have in mind so that we can actually appropriately match the uh, academic supervisor to you. So uh, because the much more advanced refinement of the ideas will be gained, um, will be done slightly later on. <coughs> The project outline form, you're required to submit that four weeks after you've, um, we have actually um, sent you the form itself. And we will, pass, we'll, we will give you a deadline so that you are aware that um, when you need to submit this to back to me. After we've received your project outline form, we'll have a look at it. And it will, what I'll do is have a discussion with the appropriate people within the department and the school itself and allocate you to a appropriate um, academic supervisor that will match your interests, but also will be able to guide you in this journey. But please be aware that the your academic supervisor may not be experts within your area of um, of, res of dissertation research. But what they have in terms of experience is the academic requirements. They know what academic requirements are uh, for a dissertation as well as they have gone, they have 
supervise many, many other master students, and therefore they know what is considered a good and excellent dissertation, and what are some of the pitfalls, and so that they'll be able to guide you so that you actually avoid them. There are multiple types of projects that a student can actually engage in. The most common type of um, project would be a project that requires data collection, whether it's in a clinic or within a service or in a place where you, where you work or somewhere relevant or perhaps in a charity as well. Now, it is possible if you want to, to actually collect your data within a university itself and we do have some um, equipment and facilities that you can use. However, I'm aware that because most of you will be away from Edinburgh, uh, therefore, this would not be a feasible choice. And besides, most of you would like to conduct projects within your workplace and your clinical areas as well. So therefore, a university-based project may not appeal to you, but it is there if you would like to um, have that as a choice. If you're data collecting within NHS, there are some things to remember is that if it's a, uh, considered a clinical trial, uh, as defined by the Health Research Authority, then what you need to do is to also obtain NHS research ethics approval. And that itself is another process that you need to maneuver. However, we have our academic supervisors are experienced in helping students man uh, uh, do uh, maneuver around the system and to help you in terms of guiding you and giving advice on what you should be doing. If you, are, if you do not require NHS um, research ethics approval, and there are some types of projects that don't require that, for example, if it's a service evaluation, it doesn't fall under the per definition of what a clinical trial is, then what you need to do is you need to discuss and have a chat with your local research and development office <coughs> within, your <coughs> within your NHS board to ask them what are the approvals required. Usually what you require are quality improvement team uh, ap approvals as well as um, um, R&D approvals. Just to make you aware, the system in terms of research ethics approval are slightly different, just very slightly different bet uh, between Scotland and the rest of the UK. So therefore, it is good um, to find out more about the requirements from your local research ethics committee or your R&D office from your NHS board. For those projects that do not require um, uh, any uh, NHS research ethics, you still need to actually apply for uh, the research ethics approval from Queen Margaret University. In fact, all projects, whether you require NHS research ethics approval or not, you still need to put through a research ethics application through the university itself. The reason for that is because um, the university is the sponsor for your particular research and therefore we need to ensure that you have got all the appropriate safeguards in place for the potential risk involved within your research so that we can actually make sure that you're adequately insured as well. Of course, your workplace will also be a co-sponsor for your uh, particular research and therefore they, are also, they will also have that particular responsibility towards you as well. There are some types of projects that do not require data collection. For example, if you are simply doing a retrospective survey or uh, analysis of the, a particular database that your workplace or some other place has actually obtained, so you are doing a secondary analysis of a database, then um, perhaps you, then you need to double check whether you require any research ethics. Some database requires you to have uh, research ethics in place in order for you to actually access the data. What we need you to do in terms of uh, Queen Margaret University is that you need to also actually put forward your research ethics through us so that we are assured that the way you, you, you approach and extract the data is appropriate. So it's worth checking with your own NHS um, uh, uh, 
authorities and want to check whether you need to get gain approval to access that particular database to extract its data for analysis on uh, for your um, master's dissertation. Now, the last category of projects would be systematic reviews. As you know, systematic reviews is a collection, is a, uh, is a systematic search of literature surrounding a particular research question and then analyzing it in a much more systematic way so that we can come to a conclusion as to the quality of the studies that has been published on this particular topic and research question and whether you are able to answer the research question to what level. For that, you still need approval. However, the approval is not at a research ethics level, and therefore, but we'll, we'll need to ensure that the, um, your approach is appropriate, and therefore you still have to send in the protocol to us in order for us to evaluate whether it's, if it's all right to proceed. If you are interested in some of the topics that's been done by previous students within the masters itself, there is a published, anonymized published list on the module hub on the Blackboard site that you can actually download and have a look just to perhaps give you some inspiration or perhaps to um, develop on to the next stage. So feel free to have a look and if you like to discuss uh, any of the topics um, regards to some of the details then the best person to approach would be the program leaders of this particular degree or if you like you can have approach me as well to have a brief chat about your, the feasibility of your project, um, sort of, uh, project approach. But the main person to discuss any of these um, sort of um, dissertation related uh, processes would be your academic supervisor. However, I will always be there to support you if you need me. As I said before, after you've submitted your project outline form, within four weeks we will allocate you an academic supervisor. And the very first thing you need to do would obviously be, obviously be to contact your academic supervisor to say hello, that's the very first thing you need to do, but also to uh, arrange for a meeting with them to have a much more in-depth discussion about what are some of the ideas that you have so that you can actually refine it into something that is feasible and efficient to conduct within the scope of a master dissertation. One thing to remember is that a master dissertation isn't, we don't require you to do groundbreaking research. However, it needs to be at a specific level where you are achieving masterness. That does not mean that your research needs to be completely novel, but what we need you to demonstrate is that you have gained some of the research skills as well as some of the academic and critical appraisal skills that is required of a master's graduate. When you have made an appointment to meet your supervisor, it's always good to be prepared. So I would recommend that you do a brief search of some of the background literature surrounding the topic that you are um, you're thinking of researching on and bring that along with you to the meeting so that you can have a much more informed discussion about what you plan to do. The direction of the topic may change, however at least you have done some background uh, uh, sort of reading just to sort of think whether this has been done before because the last thing you want to do is to do a project that has already been done before. During the discussion with your supervisor, it is advised that you actively engage in order to um, plan as well as discuss the approach of your dissertation. This would involve things like um, each other's commitments, what is each other's time schedule, what is the most appropriate methodological approach to the project itself, what are some of the additional commitments you might have that may impact on some of the intermediate deadlines that you will have, for example, sending, sending your um, dissertation drafts or writing drafts to your supervisor for them to give feedback on. Because everyone needs a bit of a holiday, so you need to plan that ahead of time in order to be able to not create too much bottlenecks or stresses um, within this dissertation project itself. 
Now, how would you uh, communicate with your supervisor? There are various ways. You can be as creative as you want. But however, this has to be agreed between you and your supervisor. For my personal experience, I've used Skype a lot um, to talk and discuss and sort of feedback uh, and, and sort of uh, interact with my master's dissertation students. And that works really well. Nothing beats uh, a face-to-face -face contact between two persons. Uh, sometimes it's much more efficient to actually talk face-to-face -face than through emails. Of course, for very simple matters, an email might suffice. However, if there are complicated or, compl or complex issues or a much more in-depth discussion is required, then I would recommend that two of you um, use Skype or some sort of online um, discussion to uh, engage with each other. Now, stage two is to develop the idea. As I said before, for those of you who are doing active data collection where there is actually data to be collected, then this you'll need to develop a proposal and also to fill out all the necessary forms for uh, uh, seeking research ethics approval. For those of you who are doing a systematic review, then what you only need to do is fill out the protocol and some, uh, some agreement forms and send it on to myself to be approved. A lot of students tend to underestimate the amount of time that all these documentation takes. The reason for that mainly is because a student also has got work commitments as well as family commitments as well as a lot of other different commitments. What we tend to do is think to think that we can achieve all of these work in our evening hours or perhaps work through the night. However, a lot of times things don't work out as they do. So you should always give yourself as much buffer time as possible. <coughs> My recommendation to you would be to take, use about one to three months to work out all the relevant documentations. Maximum three months to work out the re relevant documentation uh, before submission. This three months, one to three months will include both um, the writing up and also sending so, uh, drafts to your supervisors for them to, uh, for them to actually give you feedback on it before you've come up with the final draft for submission. After you submit it to, let's say, for example, the research ethics committees, it will take another probably one to three months, depending on the complexity of your project. Do not expect the, um, your application to be approved uh, first time round. There will always be requirements in terms of revisions and reconsiderations and amendments to be made. And therefore, we are looking at maybe um, two, or perhaps, if you are a bit unlucky, three drafts before the actual project gets approved. For systematic reviews, it's the same process that you will submit it to us, uh, to me, and then what, I'll, what we'll do as a team is to review the appropriateness of your approach for a systematic review. And we may recommend amendments to you as well, like what uh, a research ethics committee might do, except that our purview is not to look at the ethics aspect of it, but rather at the more methodological aspect of it. Always remember that it is normal for any of these approvals to, uh, to come back and forth about two or three times. That is perfectly acceptable. Do not be discouraged, but keep on doing the amendments and get guidance and advice from your academic as well as a, uh, academic supervisors as well as your clinical advisors so that you will keep on improving the um, application. And once your application comes through, what you need to do is then email me so that I can record down that you have got all your relevant um, approvals. Now, let's move on to stage three, where you've got all your relevant approvals. Now, you can't proceed on with your project if you don't, do not have all the approvals in place. And we'll make sure that you understand that. And if in doubt, always come back to me and ask me whether you are, uh, it is, if it's okay to proceed. So the, the rule is if you have not got all the approvals in place, um, you aren't allowed to actually proceed. So let's just 
say you've got all your approvals in place and now you're able to proceed. The 28-week clock starts and therefore you're on your way now to collecting your data or doing your literature search. As I said before, your very first submission for the intermediate product of this particular module is your 3,000 3, word background and review and that takes place 12 weeks after we started the clock. Just bear that in mind that this is a background and review and it will contribute a certain percentage to your overall mark. The reason why we have actually broken down into two intermediate products is because we wanted the student to build up um, in terms of their momentum as well as to um, gain different types of skills along the way. For the background review is to gain the academic skills in terms of a critical appraisal as well as critical, critical evaluation of the literature and to build up that reasoning, logical reasoning skill to provide a rationale for why you want to answer the particular research question that you have chosen. The second product, which is the 5,000 word scientific paper, the reason why we've chosen that instead of the traditional MSc dissertation, which usually takes about 10 to 15,000 words, is that we wanted you to gain skills that is much more relevant in the current climate of evidence-based um, healthcare. And one of the main things that you may, or may use or may not use is to you're required to write papers. The, the format of a particular paper goes something like introduction, background, methods, results, discussion, and then conclusion. A lot of report writing also has a similar format. Therefore, if you engage with um, writing a paper, that skill is actually transferable to other areas, for example, writing reports, writing for grants, writing for uh, um, sort of um, gaining funding for a particular service, and all of this will come into play, and, and that will help you to be able to gain the skills of using evidence to help support your argument for why you think a certain thing should be done. There are some specific responsibilities of the students. These are in a lot of we have written down all the details of your responsibilities within the handbook itself. So it is worth actually having a read. I've also written the responsibilities of your academic supervisors and your clinical advisors. Now one of the things that you need to take note of is that it is your responsibility because it's to make contact with staff. Um, it is unlikely that staff will chase you. The reason for that is because all of you are mature learners and that this entire project will be managed entirely by you. Occasionally, if you feel that you have passed a particular deadline or passed a particular time point that you need to do a certain task, we might actually remind you and contact you. But most of it should be from your own initiative. And therefore, I would advise that you um, plan ahead so that you're able to uh, manage your time and also the entire project task for this dissertation. If you are uh, meeting a supervisor and that you're, require, you're, you're requiring them to actually read something and feedback to you during that meeting itself, it would be uh, advisable, uh, it would be recommended that you send the material that you want feedback on from your supervisor at least two days before you meet up with your supervisor. The reason for that is because this gives them a little bit of time to give you much higher quality feedback. Now, two days is the minimum requirement and rec minimum recommendation. Personally, I would say you should send the work at least one to two weeks before the meeting, if possible. I am very aware that some of you would have work and family commitments and that sometimes may be a bit of a stretch. But if you actually time that appropriately, it is actually quite achievable. Another thing is to discuss with your supervisor whether they, are, they can actually um, support you within that short time frame. So it is always good to negotiate way beforehand at the very start of the project when you're likely to send in drafts. So that what that happens is, what, what can happen is then the supervisor will actually block out the diaries expecting um, expecting to receive work from you. Another important thing that you need to remember is that if for any reason that um, something may have happened that might impact on your studies, you should inform your supervisors as well as myself 
immediately. And then we can actually appropriately advise you on whether uh, you should be filling in a extenuating circumstances form so that you will be supported and that you, your time during the dissertation won't be compromised if because of that particular event. Now, the responsibilities of an acad academic supervisor is to guide you in this process, but also to provide feedback on any drafts that you send them on. Altogether, there are about five hours worth of support. Although it doesn't sound a lot, it's actually quite a lot. Um, and most students uh, use around only about five hours during that physical, uh, sort of face-to-face -face contact. What they're required to do is to ensure that they read and, and, and feedback on anything that um, you send them, but also to keep the appointments that they have with you, and also to inform you if they will be away for a certain prolonged period of time, so that you can plan any drafts as well as any meetings around um, the commitments that the supervisors and yourself might, might have from your workplace. You will obviously also have your clinical advisor from, from SOM itself. Now the role of the clinical survivor, supervisor is actually slightly different to the one for the academic supervisor. The clinical advisor will only feedback and advise you on the feasibility, clinical feasibility or feasibility of your work, uh, of your research. They won't be required to feedback on any drafts of the uh, writing that you've done. So they have to make a very clear distinction. The reason for that is because at the end of the day, the clinical advisor won't be actually marking your work. Your academic supervisor will be the second marker for, your, um, for the work that you submit for this particular module. And therefore, they can actually be aware of the context of what you've done. Now, time management is really crucial. You need to plan ahead. Well, I, I would say you need to plan about a year ahead. So it is, a, it is not a trivial commitment. So, and it is, uh, so what you need to do is have a think and perhaps discuss with your family if you've got family commitments or what are the sort of things that you need to juggle around in terms of childcare, in terms of vacation. You can still go on a vacation, however, you need to factor that in in terms of some of the um, um, intermediate deadlines that you may have to meet. Perhaps you're also doing other types of modules elsewhere besides this particular master's and you need to factor that in, in as well. What I find is that um, students tend to underestimate the amount of commitment that a lot of things surrounding their lives will have an impact on the dissert dissertation. So always plan ahead and it's always uh, good to do that. Academic supervisors tend to be fairly flexible in terms of allowing um, slightly, perhaps one or two weeks in, t uh, in, in terms of deadline um, of sending them some work to read. However, you need to negotiate with them so that they do understand that that is what's going to happen. However, saying that, the solid um, compulsory deadlines of having the 3,000 word background review and the 5,000 word scientific paper is non-negotiable. It is part and parcel of a fixed deadline for you to submit these. So these are um, sort of um, uh, nice milestones for you to put it into your um, project planning so that everything in terms of the entire journey of the tasks and events that you need to do will be planned according to these two fixed milestones. Altogether, there are two marked um, products, which is your background review, 2,000 word background and review, and your 5,000 word scientific paper. <coughs> For the proposal and the protocol, what we require you is 2,000 words. However, we also require that you, uh, you successfully um, gain approval with no more than two submissions. The reason for that is because uh, what we want to do is to ensure that students put in the work. So we have actually capped the, um, the number of times that um, they can resubmit. So after the, if, after the second try of submitting the proposal, 
um, and you still can't succeed in getting it through, then unfortunately, um, you, we, we will be asking you to leave the module. So that it's actually worth putting in the effort and getting it right the first try. Altogether, you are required to have about 600 hours of um, personal effort to be put into this dissertation project. I would say, as an average, you should take about one year, that's 12 months, to, um, from, uh, to actually finish up the entire thing, inclusive of the time when you write up the proposal and protocol, gaining all the approvals and the 28-week data collection itself. Depending on how fast or how efficient you work, or perhaps the complexity of a project, it may range from between 10 months to one and a half years, and that's the range of what you should be achieving for your dissertation project plan. But on average, one year is a good guide as to what you should be doing. So you should then plan ahead for the one year when you're engaging with dissertation in terms of work commitments. Now there are some resources that you can actually gain from. That's myself, your academic supervisors, your clinical advisors. For those of you who are doing searches, literature searches, we also have a liaison library at Queen Margaret University itself. And she, Laurie Roberts, is uh, really helpful in terms of providing support for students. And it's perfectly fine to email her. And I've given, uh, and, and her email can be found within the system. Or if you like, I, I, can, I can give that to you as well. You can actually email her and ask for some advice on what are the appropriate approaches to do a systematic review in terms of the key search terms. What I would advise you before approaching her is to have a try yourself first before you ask her because then she'll be able to then much more appropriately um, sort of guide you. If um, you were going to her completely um, uh, from a <coughs> completely without any preparation, it would be much harder for her to start you off. So now, that's mainly the introduction uh, for the dissertation project itself. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me at ctand at qmu.ac.uk. I'll be, I'll be very happy to answer any questions that you have.